An oscilloscope is another important tool when it comes to analyzing and debugging circuits. They let you see electrical signals, and you often hear it abbreviated as oscope, or sometimes just scope. They're particularly handy when it comes to measuring things like amplitude, frequency, and transient signals that your multimeter just can't catch. In older cathode ray oscilloscopes, the electrical signal under test changed the voltage between a set of vertical deflection plates that caused an electron beam to move up and down as it swept across a phosphorescent screen. But modern digital scopes take measurements using an analog to digital converter to sample the signal and then draw the waveform on a screen. While all these buttons and knobs may seem daunting at first, don't worry, I'll show you which ones you need to care about so you can begin taking measurements. To start, let's look at the user interface. The first thing you'll likely notice when looking at a scope is the display. This is where your waveform and any information about it will be drawn. Here we have two ports marked with color bands that accept probes with B and C connectors. You'll commonly see scopes with one, two, or four channels. This one happens to have two. The vertical section controls the voltage scale on the display for each channel independently. The horizontal section controls the time scale on the screen for both channels. You can manually adjust how the scope triggers with this section, which tells the scope to start measuring when it sees a particular part of a signal. The menu section contains various settings, some of which we'll use later, like saving an image. You'll also be pressing single, run, and stop quite often to start and stop measuring. As it turns out, scope probes are more than just some pieces of wire. The most common probes you'll find are passive voltage probes, which means that they measure the voltage difference between the ground clip and the tip of the probe. There are no active electronics in the probe, just some cable, resistors, and capacitors. If you were to look inside our oscilloscope, you would find that each of the input ports has a 1 mega ohm resistor and a 16 picofarad capacitor connected in parallel from the signal input to ground. Just connecting wires to the port would work for low frequencies, but since they look like antennas, they're liable to pick up noise and inject it into our circuit or measurement. To fix that, we use a coaxial cable to provide extra shielding. Now, if you look at most scope probes, you'll see a little switch labeled 1x on one side and 10x on the other. This refers to the amount the probe attenuates the signal. If you switch it to 1x, it is exactly like our drawing. The tip is connected directly to the inner wire of the coax cable, and the ground clip is connected to the shielding. While this works well for signals with frequencies less than a few megahertz, Coax cable can act like a capacitor and add more than 100 picofarads to your test circuit. This can adversely affect many circuits, especially if you're trying to capture higher frequencies. To remedy this, many probes have the option of enabling an inline 9 mega ohm resistor to isolate your circuit from the cable. This is what the 10x setting on the probe does. The 9 mega ohm resistor in the probe and the 1 mega ohm resistor in the scope act as a 10 to 1 voltage divider. It's important to note that 10x does not mean 10 times gain. It means the signal is reduced by a factor of 10. The problem with adding a resistor in line with our signal is that with the capacitance in the coax and scope, it creates a low pass filter, and high frequency signals will appear smaller. To fix this, 10x probes include an adjustable capacitor in parallel with the 9 mega ohm resistor used to compensate for the low pass filter. This will keep the signal attenuation more or less the same across all frequencies. Now, I recommend leaving the probe on 10x as that's the best compromise between signal attenuation and having the probe affect the circuit you're trying to measure. However, that does mean we need to tell the oscilloscope that we're using a 10x probe and we need to tune the compensation capacitor inside the probe. You'll likely only need to tune your probe once, but it's a good idea to check them every now and then to make sure that the compensation capacitor didn't get adjusted by your lab partner or some spooky ghosts. To start, select 10x setting on your probe and plug it into the oscilloscope. Turn on the scope and let it boot up. We'll need to make some initial changes to the settings. First, make sure channel 2 is off. Press the channel 1 button to see the input settings. Make sure you're on DC coupling, as we want to see all parts of our signal. Press the button next to probe, highlight 10x using the top left knob, and press the knob to select it. Press the trigger menu button. Make sure type is set to edge, and source is channel 1. Check that slope is set to up edge. 
These tell the scope that we want to start our measurements on a rising edge of a signal on channel 1. Most scopes come with some kind of built-in frequency generator so you can test your probes and tune the compensation capacitor. This one happens to have a 1 kHz square wave generator we can use. Attach the ground clip to the ground tab and hook the probe around the signal tab. You should see something appear on the scope's display. Now, you'll need to adjust the horizontal and vertical scale knobs so you can clearly see the waveform. Note that turning the knobs clockwise decreases the time or voltage scale, which has the effect of zooming in on the waveform. If you want to move the waveform up or down, you can adjust the smaller knob above the channel 1 button. Just note that this moves the 0 volt level for channel 1 as well. If the waveform seems to be moving or jittering, this is because the scope has no idea when on the waveform to start measuring, but we can fix that by adjusting the trigger level. Use the knob in the trigger section to raise the level to somewhere between the min and max of the waveform. This tells the scope to begin measuring as soon as it sees a rising edge, perform one sweep on the screen to draw the waveform, and then repeat the process. Note that digital scopes like this can store and display information before the trigger. Because this is a periodic waveform, the image appears static on the screen. Now, these highs and lows should appear completely flat, as we assume the scope is outputting a near-perfect square wave. If not, it's because the compensation capacitor in the probe hasn't been tuned, so we're actually measuring the signal incorrectly. Using a tiny flathead screwdriver, adjust the screw head in the probe until the square wave has straight edges. Note that some probes have the compensation adjustment screw near the probe's plug instead. Now that we have everything set up, let's take some measurements. To make some sample waveforms, I've got a mini gen board attached to an Arduino Pro Mini. I can adjust the type of waveform by pressing this button and adjust the frequency by turning this knob. To start, attach the ground clip to the negative post on the output and attach the probe tip to the positive post. Just make sure they don't short each other out. Oh, and if you don't have something to clip to, you can usually remove the hook end of most scope probes to get a fine tip that you can press to component leads and traces. Let's take a look at a sine wave. As you can see, we're zoomed in a bit too much on the time scale. Adjust the horizontal scale so we get a clear sine wave. Now, adjust the trigger level to stabilize the waveform. By pressing the measure button, the scope will perform some automatic measuring to give us things like peak-to-peak -peak voltage and the frequency of the waveform. You can also see that there is about a 1.5 volt DC offset on this signal. If you have a non-periodic signal or something the auto-measuring features can't handle, you can use cursors to manually measure waveforms. Press the cursors button and press the top menu button to turn them on. You can measure vertically, which corresponds to voltage in this case, or you can change them to measure time. Select cursor A with the menu button and use the adjustment knob to move the first line. Select cursor B and move it to the point you want to measure. Here, you can see the time between the top and bottom peaks is about 1.16 milliseconds. All that works great for periodic signals, but what if you have something that only shows up sporadically? For example, whenever I make an adjustment on this knob, the Arduino sends a digital message over SPI to the Minigen board. Let's try to capture that signal. Find an appropriate common line to attach the ground clip and attach the probe to the MOSI line. When we adjust the knob on the breadboard, we can see the message, but it disappears quickly. Since it's not periodic, it's hard to capture in view, so we need to tell the scope to only perform a single sweep once it detects a rising or falling edge, and not keep sampling and drawing on the display. To do that, we first have to set our trigger to falling edge, since this line is normally high and driven low. Set the trigger level to something below the default high voltage. We'll set it to about half the voltage. Now, press the single button, which tells the scope to start measuring once it sees the trigger condition and to stop measuring after it's made a single sweep across the display. Adjust the frequency knob on the breadboard again, and you'll see our spy data appear on the scope. You can zoom in, hit the single button again, and recapture the message to measure it and examine the bits to make sure the message looks correct. As mentioned earlier, many scopes have more than one input. Here, I've attached channel 1 to MOSI and channel 2 to SCK, which is the spy clock. Now, when I do a single shot capture, I can see how the clock signal lines up with the data bits. 
And let's say I want to save this image to my computer so I can use it in things like blog posts and lab reports. I can plug in a thumb drive, press the Save Recall button, and press Save. Wait for the progress bar to show that it's done writing and pull out the thumb drive. The picture will be saved as a bitmap in the root directory of your thumb drive. There are a few things to consider when buying an oscilloscope, and knowing what the terms mean can help you read the specs. The first is bandwidth. This is the maximum frequency range that the scope can accurately measure. The problem is that as you go up in frequencies, the amplitude of your signal gets attenuated up to about 30% by the time you reach the listed max frequency. To accurately represent a sine wave, it's recommended that you choose a scope with a rated bandwidth at least five times the maximum frequency you intend to measure. Most entry-level scopes have a bandwidth of around 100 MHz, which means they can really only accurately show sine waves of about 20 MHz, which is about 2% amplitude attenuation. If you're analyzing digital signals, you'll probably be looking at sharp edges as the signal goes from low to high and high to low. The rise time rating represents the scope's ability to draw details in fast transitions. It's related to bandwidth, and much like the bandwidth rating, it's recommended that your expected signal's rise time be five times that of the scope's listed rise time. Digital scopes need to sample a signal many times per second in order to draw it on the display, and the sample rate is the number of times per second a signal is read. Entry-level scopes will generally have around 1 to 2 giga samples per second. Here, we see the rule of five times again. To get a good reading, it's recommended that you pick a scope with a sample rate of at least five times your expected highest frequency. Resolution refers to the number of bits used to measure and quantify each sample. The more bits, the more precise each sampling will be. While there are other specifications you should consider when looking at scopes, such as probe impedance and auto measuring capabilities, these four should really get you started. Scopes can be quite pricey, but there are alternatives. For example, USB scopes are nice because they are portable and they get the job done about 90% of the time. That being said, if you want to make it look like you're doing something sciency whenever somebody walks by, all you got to do is just measure a sine wave. <laughs>